Okay. All right, so we're going to be um, doing the last uh, in this series of parables. We've done a series on the parables of Jesus, and um, this will be the last sermon in this series uh, of, of the parables. And um, if you have missed your favourite parable, if you're saying, well, well, what about the parable of such and such, then the chances are that the reason is because it has already been uh, dealt with in another sermon. So if you have a look at our YouTube channel, uh, Stop Be Stopport Evangelical Church, uh, you go on our channel, you'll see hundreds of sermons, hundreds of Bible studies, and if you search that channel, you'll probably find the parable that you're missing. Uh, but we've done quite a lot of them. We're up to parable number 30, and um, this is going to be the parable of the sheep and the goats. So if you have a Bible with you and you want to follow me, I encourage you to do that. We're going to go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And we're going to start reading at verse, verse 31. So it's quite a long passage, so uh, just make yourself comfortable. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick, sorry, and when, or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came up unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger. And ye took me in, sorry, you took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it, not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Heavenly Father, just pray as we come to your word now that you would open your word to us. Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill me, to guide me, uh, to maybe even change direction, Lord, if that is what you want. But I pray, Lord, that the words that I would speak would be your words, Lord, uh, that your spirit uh, would be upon those words. I pray that you would make uh, this Bible come alive to us, Lord, that it might be spiritual food, uh, that we might grow thereby. And Lord, I pray through all of it that Jesus Christ himself would be glorified, because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, 
So, if I was to give um, this parable a subtitle, it might be Feed the Hungry, Clothe the Naked, Take in the Stranger, Visit the Sick, and the Prisoner. And there's a sense in which Jesus has always been associated with the poor, uh, the dispossessed, the lepers, uh, you know, the outcasts of society. Uh, he's always had that kind of association. In Luke 14, verses 13 to 21, Jesus says, When thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. So it's those who can't repay you. He's saying, you know, let your, let your ministry, let your feast be to those people. And again, even as a principle, we have it in the Old Testament. Proverbs 19, verse 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. So that's interesting, isn't it? It's a sense in which uh, showing kindness to the poor in some way goes beyond just blessing them, isn't it? Yeah, it's what did it say? Um, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. So it says you're, you're doing it to the poor, but in another sense you're doing something towards, towards God. Um, so so it, 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 in some way it is blessing the Lord. But this parable is not promoting an idea of work salvation. It's not saying, look, if you go around helping all the homeless people in your town, that that will be enough. God will just say that, okay, in you come to heaven, you did enough, you worked hard enough, you did good charitable deeds and so on. It's not saying that because the New Testament is very clear that that is not how a person is saved. That's not how a person is made right with God. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So no one can, can work their way um, up to heaven. Uh, Paul says again in Romans 10 verse 6, Do not say in your heart, Who will go up to heaven? Uh, that is to bring Christ down. So Paul is saying, you know, don't say, well, you know, if, if I get this good work and then another good work and then stack another one on top of that, if I have enough good works, it's like a ladder and I can kind of climb my way up to heaven and bring Christ down. That, that's not how God works. That's not how salvation works. So salvation is by grace through faith. And the New Testament is clear about it, it says it many times, it's, it's about believing on Jesus. But some have concluded from that, and, and falsely concluded, that, well then Jesus is not interested in works. He doesn't really care what you do, because it's all about the heart, it's all about faith in him. So why would it really matter um, what, what works you did do, or what works you didn't do? And they sort of change the meaning of grace to, to the extent that they are, uh, to quote Jude, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, they're using this idea of grace as a license for people, and particularly for Christians, to commit sin. Yeah, they're saying, well, God's gracious, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And they think that that's kind of like... Uh, that, that by grace what God means is that he's tolerant of sin but you, you don't get that anywhere in the Bible throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament particularly if you read um, John's first epistle all the way through um, God is against sin he, uh, the Apostle John says these things write I unto you that ye, <coughs> that ye sin not so it's about not sinning. It's not about saying it's okay if I sin because I've got grace. I'm under grace. In fact, um, later in the book of Romans, um, the Apostle Paul says, As we have been slanderously reported, and as some affirm we say, let us do evil that good may come. Uh, so he's saying, some people are saying, Oh, well, Paul teaches that because of grace, uh, you, you could do evil. And, uh, you know, that would be okay because that makes God appear more gracious by your doing evil. 
And, and Paul is saying, no, that's slander. We would never say that. And again, in Romans 6, verse 1, um, Paul says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now, that's not God's heart. God wants a people who will walk in obedience to Christ. And that's why you have grace, is so that you can do that. Uh, so, no, that, that is not the case. That's not what grace is. So, is it the case then that Jesus uh, is maybe a little bit interested in our works, in what we do? Well, let's have a look. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. Revelation 2 and verse 18. And these are the messages to the seven churches. Verse 18 it says. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. These things saith the Son of God. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. We'll stop there. So what did Jesus say? I know thy works. So, say, so Jesus is interested in works. Otherwise, why is he naming them? Why is he listing what those works are? And in fact, if you were to go uh, through the other churches, the other six churches in Revelation, um, for example... Uh, the church at Ephesus, Jesus says the same thing. I know thy works. And again, the church in Smyrna, I know thy works. Pergamon, I know thy works. Sardis, I know thy works. Philadelphia, oh, I know thy works. Laodicea, I know thy works. So it turns out that Jesus is interested in what works Christians are doing. Um, but more than that, we can see from Revelation that not only is Jesus interested in our works, but they have a consequence on how he will treat us. So Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now you can argue about what that means, but I would suggest to you that whatever it means, it is not good. And it is a direct consequence, he says, of their works. So we are not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. But we are saved to do uh, good works. And uh, they, they are important to the Lord Jesus. And he will treat us in accordance with those works. And, and what did we read in the parable? On the day of judgment, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. He, you know, he, he will sit as a judge. He will not say, hey, well, because I'm so gracious, right, because, because I'm so tolerant of sin, uh, and because it doesn't really matter what you do, I'm going to open up the whole of heaven to every single person. Is that what this parable is teaching? Is it saying that he will do that? Quite the opposite, isn't it? He will separate the sheep from the goats. And, and the sheep, uh, they'll be on his, his right hand. And the goats, they'll be on his left hand. And it's interesting that uh, it was the custom of the Jews in the Sanhedrin, that that's where the Jews had their courts, that to place those who were to be acquitted on the right hand and those who were to be condemned on the left. And so this is this idea of, of separation and again we've seen this throughout the other parables as well in the parable of the net 
We read that at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. So there's this idea of separation. God will separate uh, the, those who are righteous, who are accepted by him, from those who are, are wicked. So we've got both, both salvation and damnation. And as I say, this is throughout many of the parables that we've looked at. Same idea. So uh, the five foolish virgins are separated from the five wise virgins. Uh, the man with one talent is separated from those with five or ten talents. The repentant publican is separated from the sort of conceited Pharisee, uh, the wheat from the weeds, and so on. I mean, it goes on and on, doesn't it? These, how many times has Jesus emphasised this idea? Not everybody is going to be saved. Not everybody's going to be in heaven. There's going to be this separation that takes place. So we are, just to reiterate, we are saved by grace through faith. But saving faith will always produce works. Why? Because it is a faith which worketh, Galatians 5, 6 says. It's a faith which worketh, and it worketh by love. James says in chapter, James 2, verse 18, I will show thee my faith by my works. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take in the stranger, visit the sick and the prisoner. As a general principle, all Christians should be doing that, or at least some of these things. But not in place of the gospel. This is not put in place of the gospel. Jesus said the poor, that's his concern, the poor have the gospel preached to them. So it's not just about doing, doing kind things for people, showing, showing kindness to the poor, but it's also about preaching the gospel, which is the kindest thing you can do for any human being, to preach the gospel to the poor. But I believe that in this passage, Jesus makes an astonishing application of these words. An incredible application. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take in the stranger, visit the sick and the prisoner. Because he says, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have also done it to me. So that should beg the question. What does he mean by that? Who are Christ's brethren? Let's have a look. Uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. So verse 46. While he, he being Jesus, yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them, unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? That's just a question that we've asked, isn't it? Who are his brethren? Who are the brethren of Jesus? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So there he's saying it's the disciples, isn't he? And, and by implication, it's all who, what was it, do the will of my Father which is in heaven. He says the same, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven, they are my brother and sister and, and mother. They are my uh, uh, family, is what he's saying. So if we apply that to the disciples themselves, and again, by, by just kind of, you know, logically thinking that out, it applies to any Christian who's doing the will of God, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 12, that he knows what it is to be hungry and suffer need. 
And that was one of the things we were looking at, wasn't it? You know, who, to, to, to feed the hungry. Again, in Philippians 1, verse 13, we read that Paul is in bonds. Uh, he's actually in prison. He's in chains. And wasn't Peter also in prison? And Silas and other believers as well. And even all around the world today, there are Christians who are in prison, who are in chains for their faith. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 as we explore this idea a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 11. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labour working with our own hands being reviled we bless being persecuted we suffer it being defamed we entreat we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day so the apostle paul is saying you know we're not we're apostles we're servants of christ but we don't have anything you know we're hungry we're, we're, we don't have proper clothes we don't have anywhere to live we're often in prison and we're like the off scouring literally we're the scum of the earth to most people that that's my friends is a christian life you are as far as the world is concerned the scum of the world you have nothing of value to bring to them unless they're seeking God, unless the Holy Spirit has convicted them of their sins, and then you have the solution to their problem, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs. Do you remember? Where, and what did Jesus instruct them to do? Let's have a look at it. Matthew 10. So Matthew 10, um, verse 11. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So, anyone who will not receive the disciples of Jesus Christ, Christ himself will take it personally. He so identifies himself with his church and and that's what this parable is saying isn't it that those who have treated christ's disciples well okay those who have received the message will be in the line of the sheep and those who have rejected that message will be in the line of the goats but for those who have believed in christ and have produced fruit in keeping with that repentance, the sheep, the king shall say, come ye blessed of my father. See, the only blessed of the father are those who have believed on the son. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. See, God always had a kingdom for his people, and he always had a people for himself. The question is, will you believe on him, and so become part of his people? There is no doubt from the scriptures that Jesus loves you. But the question is really, do you love Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you uh, because it challenges us, makes us think about our lives. 
And that's a good thing to think about you and to think about what it means to walk in righteousness. Lord, I pray for everybody who is watching this or listening to it, Lord, that you would encourage them to seek the Lord while he, might be, while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. Lord, just pray you would bless those who are watching and listening and that, Lord, they would take that message to heart. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for the truth of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing our last hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.